Sapio file. Noun. One who is attracted to intelligence. Join us, three fun loving lovers of knowledge, who are ready to dig into your favorite topics with our very own nerdy diatribes, words of wisdom, and takes on life as millennials. Welcome to the Sapio Files. Welcome back. And this week, we are super lucky because we have some fabulous guest hosts. We have three guest hosts here to talk to us about some important events in their community. So if you are not aware, June is LGBT Pride Month. And Pride Month is a series of events in which people from the LGBT community are able to join together together. Be proud of who they are and speak up. Some little history facts. It honors the 1969 Stonewall riots in Manhattan. And it was officially declared uh, officially a national month by President Clinton in 2000. And events happen all over the country. So it would be really silly for a bunch of straight girls to sit around and talk about LGBT Pride Month. So that's why we have our fantastic guest host. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask each of you to introduce yourself, tell us how you identify within that community, and then something cool about yourself that isn't specific to that. Kyle, and um, I identify as being gay, although not all of my life. I was the whole bi-curious thing when I was younger just because of confusion and the acceptance thing, but um, eventually I decided that um, I was 100% gay. I think my first ever crush was uh, Justin Timberlake. Fun fact about me is um, super into fire and rescue stuff, which I um, never thought I would uh, be doing as my career, but yet here I am. <laughs> All right. So Kayla with a K, not to be confused with our other host, Kayla with a C. Go ahead. <laughs> my name is Kayla. Um, I identify as a lesbian. I came out three years ago. Uh, I did the same exact thing where I came out as bisexual because it's easier and more conforming. Mm -hmm. Nobody yells at you really because they're like, you could end up with a guy in all actuality. I can't. Fun fact about me, I have been doing, I've been singing since I was two and I've been doing musical theater since I was 17. Uh, My name is Michael Smith Gallo. I identify as uh, on the LGBT spectrum. I am I am a G. Yeah, I'm gay. I'm I'm a gold star gay, as they say. <laughs> perfect record. Uh, perfect record. Which is not to say that I'm like. What does that mean? A Kim, Kim, a Kinsey five or a Kinsey? I'm like a, I'm like one off from the end, but like yeah, that that's like very specific to go to your Kinsey number. So I'm a Kinsey two or a Kinsey four. I don't remember which direction it works in. And. Okay. <laughs> Fun fact about me is I just, like, vis-a-vis Pride Month, I just got a cast in a very interesting play called Casa Valentina, where I play a man named George, who is also a woman named Valentina, and it's about the early history of the transgender movement. Ooh, awesome. Yeah. That's cool. Before we get into some of the, like, really specific stuff, have you guys been participating in Pride Month activities? Yes. Um, kind of I'm stuff walking in done? a parade on Sunday. Awesome. Oh, I walked great. last year with my company. Uh, Disney walks in the parade now. We cool. walked last year officially for the first time, and then we walk again on Sunday, which is really fun. This year, I've not done many Pride events because I've been, I hurt my back this week, so I haven't been to work, and this is the week where work is doing all of the Pride events. But I do advertising um, at a company called Publicis, and my client is City, and they're actually sponsoring um, two large Pride events this week. So there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of corporate sponsorship in Pride, and I think they're making a lot of inroads for not only their employees, but their agency employees. But I'm unfortunately not participating because I'm not at work. Uh, mm. I'm just sitting here at home. But I've I've done the Pride Parade in New York City in the past. I've marched in the Pride Parade. Uh, my husband at one point worked at the Hetrick Martin Institute, which is the nonprofit which used to run the Harvey Milk Gay and Lesbian High School in New York City before that became a legitimate public school. Um, nice. And then Harvey Milk um, now just runs the sort of extracurriculars because it's a very small school. So the city only gives it funding for like, you know, math and reading, but not for 
art and theater and whatnot. So my husband did the theater program there for years. So I've marched with them. I've also just gotten crazy drunk on Pride. Uh, haven't done that in a while. <laughs> That's awesome. I have never been to a Pride parade before, believe it or not. Yeah, the year has been crazy busy for me, but um, I would definitely like to go to one soon. There are so many around the tri-state area. I think that's what makes me so happy. Yeah. New York Pride is very big and vast and, like, really crowded. So if that's not your thing, you have North Jersey Pride, which is in, Ma- in Maplewood. Asbury mm-hmm. Pride, which is down by the shore, which is really fun. Philly Pride, which is the first of the month. Uh, Washington, D.C. Pride is right after New York Pride. Okay. So if you can make one, there's, like, so many. New York is the biggest of them, but it's a lot for someone, like, who hasn't been unless that's what you want to do but if you like low-key then you have so many other events which you once wanted once upon a time wasn't a thing like that just became some yeah. of them just started i've been hearing a lot about different events i i did get a chance to talk to a few teenagers actually and apparently there's a pride prom in linden which is pretty cool so I thought that was That's wicked awesome. That was awesome. That's and um, awesome. I was talking to some of the teenagers about their experiences and they said, yeah, it's becoming, you know, more of a normal thing. And a lot of them were out like way early. They were out when they were like nine. So I think that's, that's awesome that they're getting to a point where they can just be who they are that young and they don't feel that kind of pushback. What did you guys, what were your experiences with the process of figuring out who you were and did you experience a lot of discrimination or were you lucky with the people in your life? Um, I came out to my friends way before my family. I was able to be myself in front of my friends for as long as I can remember, really. Obviously, sexuality wasn't really on the agenda when in elementary school, you know, I would look at boys and I would think they were cute, but I never really, you know, thought too much about it. Um, Mm -hmm. And actually, I had like, so many girl crushes during that time. Um, I can name so many just cute girls that I used to have innocent crushes on. And it wasn't until middle school where things got pretty serious with one girl. And um, it was just, it's something steamed off to me. And I just, I didn't, I didn't know what it was until the topic came up and I just felt uncomfortable. And I, that's when I had a red flag about, okay, who are you? That's when I met my uh, one of my oldest friends, um, Brianna. Met her in seventh grade, and I, I was able to come out to her. She was one of the first people ever in my life that I came out to. And from there, it was it was easy for me to be who I was with the condition that, like every new person in the community, it was hard for me to be myself in front of my um, family. My sister, uh, my older sister, she's um, she's also a lesbian. And she had the hard treatment from the family. She was the one that shocked everyone. And some of the family had a little hard time accepting it at first. The family accepts it with open open arms now. And she's so happy and I'm so happy for her. But when I came out to my family anyway, it was that it was like, oh, yeah, we knew. No big deal. Like, okay. It, It was different with my mom. Kayla with a C knows this story but I mm-hmm. I um I remember calling Kayla the day that I told my mother and um I tried telling my mother before in a middle school setting and she pretty much told me that I was confused because of my sister and just to focus on girls and I'd be okay and I think I don't resent her for saying that in any shape or way because um I was young and she probably did think that I was just confused and I was just confused at the time so I told her, you know, fair enough. Um, if I ever show up with a boy, then I, I'm just going to say I told you so. And the conversation never really happened again until my junior year of high school when I was caught in the girl's bathroom. And my mom misconstrued it, I think, into the way she wanted it to be. And I was like, no, <laughs> like, it's not what you were hoping it was going on in that girl's bathroom. I was, you know, fixing my hair and <laughs> fixing my makeup with the girl. I've tried telling you before that I was gay mom. And at that point, she kind of just buckled down and accepted it. And um, that week, I ended up uh, also coming out to my dad's side of the family. My aunt, my dad's sister, was the first adult that I ever told. And she kept it a secret from my dad for a while. Um, But I eventually 
told my dad one day and his reaction was the best thing that I could have ever asked for. He just said, well, I didn't expect to uh, pick my son up and have him come out to me today, but what do you want for dinner? I'm like a pizza. <laughs> so my hardships never came from being who I was as opposed to the hardships that I had to face dealing with other people who didn't know who they were to the point where it, I was my I was getting hurt because in this world there's people who are okay with it and who embrace it and for their own reasons maybe it took them a long time maybe they've been okay with it for their whole life and on the other side of things you have the people who deny it and who don't want to be it because they're afraid for whatever reason religion family um, they try to suppress it but these moments they show you a side of them that no one else sees and you end up developing these feelings for these people and you just get crushed <laughs> you get crushed in the um in the journey of it and it becomes your problem but at the same time it's, i've learned that you cannot force them to want to be or to come out as who they are you, you can't force it it would be like someone telling me back when i was going through it like no you need to come out today and you need to mm -hmm. you need to do it it just it doesn't work like that and mm -hmm. that that's my biggest hardship with dealing with it and kayla knows all about it <laughs> mm -hmm. i do <laughs> right so i am not a young person <laughs> so i'm 41 and I feel that I really came of age at a time where obviously I, it was not Stonewall time and it was definitely not the 1980s AIDS crisis time, but it was not a time where LGBT rights were as sort of open as they are now. To, to put that in perspective, Will and Grace became a TV show when I was a senior in college. So. Okay. We didn't have a lot of media exposure of, of this is what gay people look like. When I was a kid, I, I kind of knew, oh, I'm not popular and it's probably because I'm chubby and I don't really fit in and I'm not good at sports. But, you know, you, you sort of like inherently see yourself as an other. But I've known people like my age who are like, oh, I've known I was gay since I was in kindergarten. And I'm like, I did not know what gay was. I didn't know what sex was until... I was at least 12. Um, and even then, I didn't understand what it was. So it wasn't like a, I grew up as a gay kid. But um, when I got to college, I kind of was like, okay, this is something that, um, you know, is probably part of my reality. Uh, I ended up getting a boyfriend. I ended up hooking up with a boy who then became my boyfriend. And that was a big eye opener. And while at the time, I, so I went to Yale, like all of Yale's courses were in this thing called the Blue Book which now is online only, but it used to be a big blue book because our color was blue. But there was this smaller book called The Pink Book, which um, talked about all of the gay and gender studies courses that you could take. And The Pink Book was very controversial and whether or not a professor would want to like actually profess openly that they were teaching a pink book class or whatnot, like history of, of like gay history or whatever. And that was like, oh, that's not something I'm going to do. And I feel like it's stupid because I look back in my life and I'm like, oh, that could have been a great resource to 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 come of age. And I kind of let it go by mm -hmm. so much so that like when I moved to New York City to go to grad school, I kind of end myself again, which was really complicated for a while. Um, and then I was directing a med school, a med school production of Company, <laughs> which is my favorite musical of all time. But right there, you're like, OK, that boy, something's up with him. But then I was looking at my cast, which has seven men in it, and five of the men were gay. And it's a play about marriage. And I'm like, what the heck am I doing, like, being closeted? And mm -hmm. so I kind of, like, came out for real at some point in, in grad school. So only when I was, like, 25 or 26. Cool. It's later. I mean, for some people, that's early still. But, you know, for most people, I think that's late. Cool. Yeah, I think that's also, I guess, generational. Like, I, like the kids now, it's a lot of them are out when they're, like, nine years old. I think it's great. And I think I think it speaks a lot to a lot to where society's come a lot to where kids are able to 
learn about themselves and a lot to what parents are willing to understand and accept and love in their kids, frankly. You know, I told you, I was like, oh, I was an unpopular kid. And when I was in middle school, I, I like when I was around 12, I was like, I don't know if I was clinically depressed, but I was like, mom, dad, I'm really unhappy. And I kind of made that clear to them. And they let me go see a shrink. And like, she's like, oh, Michael's sad, but nothing's chemically wrong with his brain. And like when I was 27 or so, I was seeing another shrink and I was like, oh, my God, I was going to the shrink when I was 12 because I was gay and I didn't fit in. Now, I didn't say that to her because that wasn't my words. And it was 1989. I'm sure she didn't pick up on that. You know what I mean? Right. And it's like now it would have been like, oh, are you feeling that like, would have been yet? Is this why you feel you don't fit in? And then we could explore that. And I think a lot of parents are accepting of it. I don't want to say it's all like peaches and roses because there's definitely a lot of parents who are not accepting of that. But yeah, I mentioned Dale talked, uh, taught at the Harvey Milk uh, High School or at the Hatcher Martin Institute. And so this was a couple years ago, well, several years ago, because they're probably now, they may have just turned 30, but let's say they're 29. Two of his students who are now 29, at the time they were 16, and um, they've become very dear friends of ours, so much so that, so Glenn and Johnny, they're, they're, they're born one day apart. They look nothing like, we call them twins, but one is a six foot two, 200 pound African American man. And one is five foot seven, 112 pound Puerto Rican boy. So they don't look like twins at all, but they're like best buds. And they really are like their own kind of special brothers. And they were each our ring bearers at our wedding. We've maintained like this long-term relationship with them. And um, Johnny will literally send Dale a Mother's Day card every Mother's Day and me a Father's Day card every Father's Day. That's really nice. And I don't want to get into like what that means about gender norms. That's just the way Johnny has picked it. So that's the thing (laughs) that's, that's on Johnny, but you know, it's like, Oh, when you talk about intergenerational things, it's like, they weren't the nine year olds, but they were the 16 year olds. And then they found role models who were about 30. And there is a, there is an interesting generational thing that that's passed down. The truth of it is that like when I went to gay bars, when I was 25, there were no men in their 50s. There would be occasionally men in their 60s or 70s, but the men who would have been in their 50s are the men who unfortunately died in the AIDS crisis. Mm -hmm. Like there actually was like visibly to me, like a missing generation of people, Wow. um, which I think stunted like my cohorts, like ability to accept like who we are and where we came from and what is our connection to Stonewall, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And now when you watch like RuPaul or whatever, like and you have Aquaria who's 21 or, you know, and Aquaria is pretty smart, but some of the 21 year olds are dumb. And there's like, no, you got to learn your history. Like and, and this is the reason you've got to learn your history, because like there's this missing generation of people and we have to make sure we fill in those blanks. But I think, you know, now that we are sort of past that as a as a scourge on the population, um, it really is becoming a how can we pass down knowledge and how can we make you more open and and how can the younger generation challenge us about, you know, how to deal with the concept of transness. And right. I think like even there, the vocabulary has changed in the last four years that things that I would say four or five years ago are like patently unacceptable now, but they were just fun loving jokes then. And it's because. Young people are like, hey, no, be more inclusive. Stop being so small minded. And and we're like, oh, were we? We thought we were the most open people in the world. I knew uh, when I was in kindergarten, girl, she was like real cute. And I was like, hey, sis, not just that. I watched (laughs) that 70s show for the first time. And I don't know if anybody's ever seen that show. Mm -hmm. Yes. But Mila Kunas is on there. And I was like, wow, this is nice. This is, that's a thing. And then of course, you know, I grow up and, and I'm a bookworm. So I read mm-hmm. a lot. So I, I read up and stuff like that. And then I really knew who I was when I got into middle school. Mm-hmm. But I'm raised yep. in church. And I am a very religious, I have a very religious family. When I was in middle school, I actually wanted somebody who I knew was shunned out of my church because she Ooh. was discovered. Oh, that's, that's awful. awful. And I was like, wow, no. I like, I tried to date dudes. I had a whole, I had like three whole boyfriends. Like it was lit. I did things I shouldn't have been doing. Mm -hmm. Trying to like figure things out way too young than I should have been doing things, but that's neither here nor there. And 
you know, I fell in love at 19 and um, finally at 20, I had the courage to like set my parents down and like talk about it. I got so nervous. I told my sister first and she kind of looked at me and was like, duh. She was like, okay, okay. Can you, can you go make dinner? I don't really, we know. Like I, I had like a whole like moment and I was like, I don't want you to think that I'm different. Mm-hmm. You um, know, this is the thing that I'm going through. And she was like, why are you crying? I know. What do you, what, get up. <laughs> what are you doing? Talk to my parents. That was a lot harder um, because I had to not only tell my parents that I liked women, but I was in a relationship for five months without them knowing, which was like a big thing. Mm. And they knew that I was dating someone. They didn't know the gender. And I remember I sat my mom down. I sat my dad down. And, you know, I love my parents and they're great parents. But um, at a point when I was about to speak, I remember my mother said, you better not tell me. You're about to tell me you're dating a girl. Oh. And I was like, here's the thing. Surprise. I am. My, my mom didn't talk to me for about two weeks. The thing is, she's from an older generation. She's also from down south. So that's like not a thing. Right. No one really like, no one really does that. And, you know, we came to, we sat down, we talked about it. Everything was good. Everything was gravy. I'm no longer with her. I'm now with another girl who was like awesome. And now she's welcome around my family to the point where if I don't bring her around, I get yelled at. Uh, it was scary at first because you watch all the Lifetime movies where everybody gets thrown oh, out. Oh, yeah. And you watch all, and then, like, you know, if you're raised in a church, everything can be prayed out and shunned out and all types right. of things. And, but I overcame, and I'm still overcoming. Uh, it's been three years, and I've been able to, like, really get to know myself in a way that I never thought I could. And, of course, you still have ignorant people, but but right. it, but but what I say is when you do it, it feels like a weight is gone. Like, it feels like... You had this big weight on your back for years, however long you knew and you didn't say anything. And you finally say something. And even though you're crying because maybe it didn't work out or maybe somebody or maybe somebody didn't accept you, you feel this weight and you feel so light because you can finally be. I mean, as someone who comes from a very, very faith filled background, I'm just so sorry that that's the reaction that that, um, I, I absolutely despise when people use their faith and religions to put others down when really the core of our faith is to love one another. So I am just sorry that happened to you. And I'm so glad that you overcame that and that you've found acceptance. And it's, yes, it's just so wonderful to hear that you've had that weight lifted off your shoulders. So I apologize and I thank you for your courage. That's amazing. Yeah, actually, in my research, because obviously I research and I'm a total nerd about all this stuff, I went on a literary analysis on the Bible, actually, because I I thought this topic might come up. Me too. (laughs) I don't know if either of you are aware or if any of our listeners are aware, but the word homosexual did not appear in any translations of the Bible until 1946. Yeah. The original word... Malakoi, which is the word that was in that passage that always gets quoted and put on posters, like they will not inherit the kingdom of God passage, initially meant soft and was most frequently used in that time period to refer to people who are spineless, to refer to people who are not standing up for things that are important, which is a little ironic that that then got translated to effeminate and then homosexual. Oh, wow. So it is much more likely that that passage initially meant if you're spineless and you don't stand up for other people that you wouldn't inherit the kingdom. There are texts of the Bible of the Bible that have never been released. Not just that, but a big one, another big one that everybody uses is God. The Bible says man shall not lay with man. Mm -hmm. The original translation is man shall not lay with child. Yes. Mm -hmm. I had that one too. Which means don't be a pedophile. And I think that everybody should stand by that. But there is, there is a, there was a text in the Bible, which nobody talks about, which is actually a book. I forgot which book, but there's a book in the Bible where there's actually like a whole homosexual relationship mm-hmm. and like nobody, nobody, everybody thinks that it's just like buddies, but no, it's not. And the text that we have not read, we don't know. And the, the thing about the Bible is, is that they are man-made translations. That's Absolutely. what people don't Absolutely. understand you can't tell me that the Bible told you that, that God hates gays because the book of Job was written by Job. And, you know, a lot of Catholics are an uproar because the new Pope has not condemned homosexuality. Which he I love. Stood I up and been amazing. Like, oh, oh, this Francis is not wrong. <laughs> this makes no sense. What are we doing? It's, 
And so now you have, you really don't have a leg to stand on. If you want to quote the Bible, then that means that you can't wear polyester blends. You yeah. can't eat shellfish. <laughs> yeah. You shouldn't be eating meat. You shouldn't have any tattoos. You shouldn't have any piercings. And you shouldn't be having Netflix and chill because premarital sex is a sin. So if yeah. <laughs> you quote one part, you have to quote the other. And exactly. that's what people hate. You have to take mm -hmm. the whole text, not just one part. Right. And I have Absolutely. a very hard time believing that the entire premise of Christianity is to be like Christ. I'm sorry, but I don't believe that Jesus would have condemned people for being who they were. He, that's just not who he was. It's not. No, the, he was not like that. And even Another in all of their fact. mistranslations, he's never the one saying any of it. Nope. Another fun fact, um, Christianity is based off of the New Testament, not the Old Testament, mm -hmm. just the New mm -hmm. Testament. Yes. Judaism is based off the Old Testament. So if that's what we're doing in the New Testament, there are no speaks of anything that has to do with shunning of anything of anyone, any race, color, sexuality, size, gender of nothing, because it is the forgiving text. Jesus was born, he was brought, he took all of our sins away, and now God is super nice. In the First Testament, God was not nice. <laughs> he shunned people. He turned people into pillars of salt. He made a flood. He was busy. But <laughs> Christianity is based off of the New Testament. And that's what a lot of people don't yes. fully research and understand. Right. And not to mention the fact that Jesus himself was shunned by a number of people who were leaders in the community at the time because he was so accepting of other people so adding that to everything that you just said and that chelsea said before how can someone use that as an as a defense for being i guess just afraid of someone else who's a little bit different than them no it was very important to me that i had a church wedding and my husband is not religious or particularly spiritual at all but I was like, oh, I want to, and I didn't get married in a church, but I got married by an Episcopal priest. And it was important to me because I kind of looked at it and I'm like, all right, I'm being married by two in institutions. I'm being married by the church and I'm being married by the state of New York. And this church has been marrying people for millennia. And the state of New York has been marrying people for about 13 months now. Which of these rights are more permanent? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, which are more transferable? And, and so it, it like it wasn't just a it wasn't just a legal thing, but you know it was a you know I I wanted to make sure it counted. My husband kind of rolled his eyes, but um, in honesty, they made us. Then once I became a member of the church, they made Dale and I um, go through. They said, "There's no specific number. We'll know when we're done." But for us, it was five. We went to five like counseling sessions with the priest, okay. and at one point, the priest said, you know, what is it that you believe in? And I was like, okay, I believe in God. And, you know, I believe in Jesus. And this all makes sense to me. And, you know, it's my heritage. And that's what I grew up with. And then he turned to Dale. And Dale, like, grew up. He understands what Jesus is. But, you know, he's like, that's not. And 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 the priest said, well, wh what do you believe in? Like, what drives your soul? What gets you up in the morning? What keeps you going? And Dale's a theater teacher. And he says, you know what? What keeps me going is the love of getting up and going to school and working with children and and sparking a a love of art and a love of theater in them. And and the priest, whose name was Hugh Grant. Yes, I was married oh. by Hugh Grant. Excellent. But anyway, <laughs> Father Hugh Grant. So Hugh Grant, um, that what one dale over is he said well that's wonderful that means that that's your belief that's your touchstone what he did not say was and you see that spark that you put in people that's god because that would have been a bridge too far for dale and he'd be like ah see here's you're trying to trick me to believe that i believe in god and he's like no i just want you to believe that you believe in something larger than yourself and he's like no i totally believe in something larger than myself and and sort of by analogy without speaking it that's religion so, yeah. so we're religious or I'm religious and Dale got married by a priest. I well, have not it? really run across like any non cake bakers. Mm -hmm. I know they're out there. It like bothers me. Yeah. You know, it really does. Um, well, yeah, me too. I don't think that's what the religion really is supposed to be at all. I think they're no. misinterpreting the Bible. They're misinterpreting things from different historical eras like it, it just doesn't actually line up with what Jesus would have wanted, I think. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, like the people that I've met, I mean, they may be holding their their cards close to the vest, but 
the people in Dale's very Texan, very Baptist family that I've met have very much wholeheartedly accepted me. Now, mm-hmm. they, the, 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 like some of the second cousins who I haven't met firsthand, like they may every once in a while say something off. But again, generationally, because it's interesting how Facebook works, Dale will like be like, oh, but their son just totally went off about why mom and dad were wrong. So it mm-hmm. is an interesting thing of like, I think religion's take on it is changing, even in the places where religion is seated in opposition to LGBT rights. That's not to say, okay, so let it take a course because, you know, it's it's a struggle. Yeah, so I think one, I think one last thing is most people, and this is so sad, but most people use Christianity or any religion as a shield as to why they don't believe in mm-hmm. this. Cool. Let's put this to perspective. You see that a person is happy. You can see that a person is in love. You can see if they're healthy. You can see that they, if they're raising children, that their children are in a loving environment and that there was nothing wrong with their kids. I am a Christian, so of course I believe that God is, is great and he yeah. is amazing, but I've never seen him. Translators can say whatever they want to say. Mm-hmm. And there are books of the Bible that we are not allowed, that we are not allowed to see that are currently in the Vatican, that Lord knows what those books are. And most of them are from female disciples because exactly. the translators originally thought that female disciples did not have any merit. Yeah, there, there so is actually a gospel of Mary Magdalene, too, that yeah, isn't yeah. released. And if you sit and you think you believe that there is an all-knowing being that knows exactly what to do, how to do, and when to do it, and that, that they have the best interest in you and that they know exactly how you're supposed to be. But you see and, somebody who is in a same-sex couple who is in love. You can see that they're healthy. Nothing's happening. Their children are raised perfectly. Their kids are great, are well-known citizens. But you think that that's wrong. And, you know, yeah, and everybody's if, supposed to be made in God's image. So if God made these people, then why are you questioning God? You could also yeah. take it that way. Not only that, but the Jesus that I believe in, know, and love was an individual who put as much faith in people, no matter what their background, no matter their gender, their class, their upbringing, whether they are rich or poor, he just put faith in people. And if we truly want to be Christ-like for anybody that is of the Christian faith, then that's what you need to do is put your faith in people and put your faith in the love that you can clearly see and put your faith in the fact that love can come in so many different forms. Yeah, love thy neighbor as thyself. He was one of the most accepting, or if not the most accepting figure in history. So altogether, um, you both said that on in your process, there was a time that you thought maybe you were bisexual. What would you say to people who yep. take stories like that and use it to say bi isn't a thing? Um, I would so, say you're I mean, ignorant. Well, yes, <laughs> but I, yeah. I've heard people make those kind of ignorant comments and like, you know, how can we recognize all of the people who are part of this community? I, I will admit, I will be the first to joke, oh, bisexuals don't really exist. They're just gay men who are kidding themselves. But that's not actually true. Yeah. Like, that's like a joke that persists. I, I just said it on your podcast, but it's, <laughs> but it's not true, listeners. You know, no. like bisexual people exist. But um, it, it must be a very, very hard existence to be able to, you know, find partners who are open to that and accepting of that and and... And, you know, and, and, and not question it, because ultimately, when you try and find a partner, you're fine trying to find someone who accepts you mm-hmm. and isn't, you know, like just wondering what's up. Right. Um, and so the more unknown your population is to the greater group, the, the harder, the harder it is. Yeah. No, I think there's there is some like erasure of bisexuality, too. Like if you're with somebody of the same gender now, you're you're just gay and people see you that way. And if you're with somebody of. The opposite gender okay now you're just straight and maybe that's i think not, also it's like if you're a woman really and you're is. bisexual you're yeah. experimenting and if you're a man who's bisexual you're transitioning to being gay i think those are like the common misconceptions but i think uh, it could go either way for either gender may, I, maybe but th- that's the way i see it mm-hmm. like that's the way i see the paradigm playing out the most i'm not saying that, that that's correct i'm just saying i think i think that's the bias Mm-hmm. I think that's where a lot of people's heads are if they're not woke, as it were. <laughs> Being bi 
or identifying as bisexual, you know, some people do. Some people use it as as a way of easing into coming out because in a family setting, you kind of think if I say that I'm bi, you know, my family at least thinks that I'm still half into the norm in society, but it, and then it also gives them that other 50%, like I'm gay too. So, but there's definitely people who are attracted to both. You know, I wish we lived in a world where we didn't have these labels. And although I'm proud to be gay and I'm proud of the journey that I've taken and so many other people who have it so much harder than me, I think so m much of the time we get caught up in those labels where I just wish we lived in a world where it's like we could just be free to like someone for being them and not mm -hmm. for being a boy or a girl. You know? Like we were all just people. I think when it comes to people trying to say that bisexual isn't a thing, I take it as several things. I take it one as the separation of bisexual and bi curious. Mm -hmm. People don't know the separation of that. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard to try to explain that they're two separate things. And just like Kyle said, sometimes you use it to come out because it's easier for your parents to be like, there's still a chance that I'm going to get grandchildren the normal way. Like, you know, instead of adoption or surrogacy or in vitro or you know whatever methods those who are gay yep. or asexual or anything decide to use mm -hmm. but there are people who come at us by and are by i have several friends who mm -hmm. have uh experienced the well you can't be bisexual because you're with the girl and it's like that's literally the definition of bisexuality mm -hmm. yep well you can't say that you like vegetables because right now you're eating a steak that don't make no sense yeah, <laughs> I. It, it's like it when when you when you compare it to to things that are mundane, people feel really dumb. But it's like, what's your favorite genre of music? Right, like you could have two depending on your mood. Oh, you, you know, I um, I like rock and I like musical theater. No, 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 no. you can just have one. What? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I said what that's... I said. You can just have one genre of music. You can only eat one meal for the rest of your life mm -hmm. because that's how people feel comfortable. And mm -hmm. my, my truth is not to make you comfortable, it's to make me comfortable. And if you're not comfortable with it, that sounds like a P squared, a personal problem. <laughs> Another thing I actually wanted to bring up and needs recognition, I actually, um, initially there was a transgendered individual who wanted to join us today. Unfortunately, there were some legal issues and it could have put this person's job in jeopardy to speak in a public forum. Okay. So obviously, you know, that comes first. But yeah. It, I would be interested to hear, like, you know, everybody's experiences interacting with transgendered individuals and how that is different. Um, there's a lot of ignorant people who will say things like, well, aren't they just overreacting to being gay? Oh, boy. Yeah, yeah. I know a few awesome people that are trans and, you know, they're not any less human than anyone else. And I think what they go through is remarkable. I mean they know who they are and they're willing to make the changes to make it happen. It's so, I want to say it's so much harder to, to go through that than just some, than just coming out as being um, gay or bi or lesbian. But I don't know if it's something that everyone struggles with um, or thinks about. Um, I can say that I've questioned it myself. Um, not so much that I, wanted to go out and do it one day but i thought to myself you know being gay sucks sometimes and um you fall for the people who don't notice you because they're you know straight and it's makes you think like or made me think rather you know i didn't ask to be born a guy you know mm -hmm. if i was a girl this would be normal and i would probably end up with people who i want to end up with but at the end of the day, I can't think like that because I am who I am. And although I do dress up in drag, which is a blast, I personally don't have any ultimate desire to go out and change my gender. But, you know, kudos and props to the people who feel that strong that they were born in the wrong body, that they can do that. I praise them. Right. And I think it's a difference between who you are and who you're attracted to. So, you know. Yeah. Yes. Kyle, you look you look beautiful. You <laughs> do. 
I've seen drag pictures of you. You're a beautiful woman in those. I have to add you on Facebook once we're done because I want to see pictures. Okay. <laughs> beautiful. I love, I love drag. My best friend is trans. I mm-hmm. met him uh, when he was beginning his transition. And we've been friends for, I want to say, five to six years. And it's been this amazing journey to go on with him. Um, he had no, there was no testosterone. There was nothing. He was literally in the beginnings and I met him and I immediately, uh, one of the things that I, we, we clicked cause we met at a club, we met at a gay club and we instantly clicked. And then, you know, I was just like, what's your name? Like who, like, what's his name? Who is this guy? And then he like, he like took me to the side. I was like, I just love that you're using my pronouns correctly. And I was like, are you trans? And he was like, yeah. And I was like, awesome. Let's go. Let's let's go dance. That's great. And so I've been here and watching his journey. He actually does uh, speeches, and he does uh, he does talks at his college. He goes to Keene and he does them outside, but he does mm-hmm. lectures on it because people are so curious about it, mm-hmm. and with the hate crimes that have been happening to uh, trans people and uh, and you know the LGBTQ community altogether, the hate crimes that have happened recently recently are terrible and a lot of them have been trans people and so people mm-hmm. are just wanting to be to the know and to see his journey and you know he hasn't gotten any of his surgeries yet but like he's auntie and they're regular people they're human people and having to sit and explain to people that he's straight he's straight but he's with a girl i know but he ha- he's a girl he's not but he has girl all right all right mm-hmm. all right relax you woke up you were born in your correct body, and that's beautiful, and that is amazing. But some people were not. I know that I'm a girl, and it has nothing to do with my body part. It has to do because I identify as a woman. Your body doesn't have anything to do with who you are. Right, right. and your your gender identification has nothing to do with, oh, so, you know, this, this guy wants to be a girl. Does that mean he, this girl is going to be lesbian or what does that make it's, right it's it has like, nothing to do with it i think the, yeah i think the tra- i think the trans population is the most of the if you're going to break it down to there are four populations and they're probably mm-hmm. like eight so you know but like right. let's just try and simplify for just the sake of argument right the trans population is probably the most misunderstood or the, the you know the least understood right. um because we grew up on sort of news stories about 2020 about like this man wants to be a woman and this woman wants to be a man. And, you know, I, I have a voice teacher who um, is a biological man, but now no longer identifies as a man or a woman and their pronouns are they, them and their. And I sometimes mess up and, Mm -hmm. and and I was about to say he, uh, they grandfather me in because they say, okay, you knew me when I was he, but you know, I, I, I just don't like it when people blatantly ignore it. You know, it's okay if you mess up, but yeah. it's, it's much more complicated than, you know, okay, eight years ago, I understood that trans people were people who, you know, were just the wrong one and, and, and they, they, and they'd switch and to be fine. But now it's, oh, there's a spectrum and some people want to be both and some people want to be neither and some people want to go back and forth. And, and as someone right, like who, gender fluid. That kind of population? Yeah. Yeah. Right. There's a gender fluid population. There's a gender non-binary population. And literally, like, having just been cast in this play, even just in the last 24 hours, I've been trying to, like, research lots of these terms. And and and, and my head is spinning. Yeah, there and, are so and, many. It seems like there are just so many new terms. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, they're new to – and some of them are, like, they're new to you. Like, the term right. transgender I just learned was coined in, like, 1965. It didn't exactly mean exactly what it means now, but the word's been around for forever, Mm -hmm. you know? So it's not a matter of, I think there are people who don't understand and do want to offend, but then there are people who who want to be completely well-meaning, but fall into, fall into traps of misunderstanding. Um, And it really is just a conversation. And to me, it's like, look, if people didn't understand, like I am wholeheartedly male. I have never, like, I'm very gay. But I've never thought that I wasn't male. Mm -hmm. So it's like, all right, I I, I don't really understand what it feels like what you're talking about. But but I'm going to listen and I'm not going to tell you that what you're feeling is wrong. Like what you're feeling is what you're feeling. It just happens to be very different than what I'm feeling, you know? 
Yeah, and I, I think, think that with my understanding... voice teacher, it's very interesting too because even I have to ask them. I'm like, hey, would it be okay if I said you have an anatomically male larynx because that's how they make their living, right? Mm-hmm. And I don't, I, I, I actually don't know. I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm having a call with them tonight, like well, with them tonight mm-hmm. <laughs> to see. I, I know. I see, it's, it's, hard, it's confusing. Yeah. It's not confusing. It's just, you, you, we've spoken you a get, language for you get decades up, yeah. and you know, it's, it's hard to learn a new language. It's not wrong to want to though. Mm-hmm. Right. It's yeah. Whole, one of my favorite YouTubers who is, uh, I don't know if anybody know who Gigi Gorgeous is. Yes. Mm-mm. She I'm started. Sure. Yeah, come. She started out as Gregory Gorgeous on YouTube in mm-hmm. the early 2000s and has since transitioned. And she, her fiance, is this gorgeous lady. They look cute together. They're both blonde. They like share. They like share hair products. It's beautiful. And in in her comments, she has she's had to um, disable her comments on her YouTube videos because people are like, "You ended up with a woman. Why didn't you just stay a guy?" That's, a, that's such an ignorant statement. She also was banned from Dubai. She okay. got held in a Dubai what? airport for a week because Dubai wouldn't let her enter because she's trans. What? She like oh flew. God. She got her visa got approved. Everything got approved. She flew to Dubai. They asked her what she was doing. She said she was a YouTuber. And somehow they got in the conversation. Mm-hmm. And she does, she's never quiet about the fact that she's trans. Never. And you shouldn't have to be. But as soon as they found out, they detained her and they told her that she was not allowed to enter Dubai. And she had to stay at wow. a she had to stay at a hotel near the airport. She actually wasn't allowed to leave the hotel until she was going back into the airport to leave Dubai. She wasn't allowed to step foot on Dubai grounds. That's heartbreaking. It's, it's terrible. And, you know, the fact that this kind of this level of discrimination still exists in today's world you know, that's something that I think everybody needs to think about, especially people who are not part of this community. People like people like me who were fortunate enough to be born in the correct body and have like the quote unquote normal sexuality need to actually think about these things with these people. And everybody's just a human. Like, why can't we just treat everybody like a human? Right. It's, it's absolutely true. And the, and the, truly chilling and sad and terrifying truth behind all of this is that this case of what happened to um, the YouTuber in Dubai is not a singular case. And there are even places that students come to me and they want to study abroad originally, but because they're within the LGBTQ community, they, their life could literally be threatened if they went to certain countries because certain countries consider it illegal, which is, it's horrendous. But I mean, I actually have a number of students who have decided to come to Ireland as their study abroad experience because Ireland is a country that's accepting. And so it's just, it's heartbreaking for me to think that just because one human is different than another human, that that human shouldn't have the same rights and safety as I do, just simply because I was, like Chelsea said, born in the body that I, you know, identify as, and, um, and that I am the heteronormative, (laughs) I suppose, it's it's crazy because a lot of people also say that like this just became a thing and you know this was just a thing and you have to you have to remember that it wasn't this is not a thing that that sprouted because the millennials were born no that's not how this worked this is not this is this is a this is a moment of having to sit back and having to really think this is not the first accounts of it. This is the most because people are willing to be accepted and people are willing to uh, not hurt other people to be normal. You have people that literally marry the opposite sex, have children, and then wait until they are like in their 60s and 70s to be their true selves. Right. Yeah. And that hurts people. That hurts the people that you were originally with that hurts your children because they don't understand it. And to them, it just seems like a quick change but that should prove to you and people don't see that like Caitlyn Jenner is a perfect example of that. Bruce Jenner loves women. When she was Bruce Jenner, she loved women. She had so many guard brands, Chris, and you know, Chris happened. They had two beautiful kids. He also has Brody and like other kids from his first marriage and then transitioned into Caitlyn, which is a beautiful transition. And she had to wait so much later because she felt like she wouldn't be accepted, but she has a girlfriend who lives with her. And so she gets the same thing of, 
but why didn't you, why didn't you just stay with Chris? Cause you like women. And why didn't you just stay a man? Cause you were, you were already doing what you were planning on doing. This is a perfect example of people who decide to not live their truth. And then in the end, in the hurting themselves or the people that they use this as a shield because you didn't live it. But this has been happening for so long. People have been right, like this for right. so long. People have aunts who have had roommates that are the same sex that have never been married and their roommate lives in the same bedroom as them. And because they can't afford two beds, there's one bed and they don't do anything together. They're both straight, but they've been living together for 10 years and have a cat and an adopted son. Like that's not, these are things now that you put two and two together, you're like, Oh, auntie Sheila likes women. Yes. Mm -hmm. She lied because this is just what she had to do. But this has been, this has been around for so long and people for people to be like, this is, this is a new thing. (laughs) <laughs> made a new epidemic. It's the millennials. Everything is our fault. <laughs> on on this note, what would you say to individuals? And I get this from a lot of students who ask me this question, and adults more often because I feel like as a millennial, I'm that go to person in my fields that people are like, so the LGBTQ community, <laughs> because I have several friends who identify as many different things. What would you say to individuals who are maybe a little bit afraid of asking the why question or the I don't understand question because they feel like they might insult someone. Um, How would you encourage them to approach the question of explain to me, you know, how you came to this conclusion about yourself or explain to me what the difference is between bisexual and bicurious or explain to me this, like, is it just a simple question of asking the question? I I know, you know, Kyle, with you and I, I always just asked you and Mm -hmm. it was open like that but I think sometimes people just have trouble because they feel like they're going to offend but I feel like it's more offensive to not ask the question and not try to understand so what are your takes on that straight to the point in my opinion like I don't I personally it's just my characteristics like I don't have any problems answering questions that people have and they can be as blunt as they want about it and um I I don't really get offended easily and if I do then you said something really wrong. Um, right. <laughs> but I think that it, it honestly depends on the person's uniqueness with their personality. A lot of people, like, especially, and it all depends on what stage they're in, really, when it, when it comes to their coming out story. Like, if you ask someone like me, who's been out pretty much his entire life, I'm not going to be ashamed of anything, and I'm not going to try to hide any bit of information that they're seeking for but if you ask someone who's fairly new or in the process of coming out themselves they're they're going to be a little bit more touchy and a little bit more um selective with what they want to hear right because they're also still figuring out those things themselves i think if you say it like hey I have some questions, you know, um, after the initial shock of everything, my mom sat me down and she had questions and I love, Mm -hmm. I love curiosity Mm -hmm. and I love questions with anyone, with anything. Um, I'm, I am a lesbian, my best friend's gay, my other best friend is trans. We are the walking, I I think my friend group is actually the LGBTQ community represented. Like we're like (laughs) a tribe, We're, we're like the superheroes of it. (laughs) <laughs> and we started we started uh, a saga in our um, college, which was the Straight and Gay Alliance. We ended up tra- changing the name because it's more than straight and gay. But uh, we had people who came in and had questions. And this was, this was, no, this was a little bit before I came out. I came out to my friends first. And of course, you know, there are questions and I'm so willing to answer. But it has to be a hey, I have some questions. Or if you start off by saying, I'm just a little curious, but I don't want to offend. What you shouldn't say is, hey, um, what's up with that gay thing? Like there, there are <laughs> the, way, <laughs> the way you word it. Like, yeah, I, I have friends who ask me, you know, I have, I have friends who are curious about sexual aspects of me. And I'm a, a lot of people aren't open about that, but I am because one, you, I don't care if you know, <laughs> and two, it's an educational thing. But like, if if you come up to me and you're like, so like, how do you? And you're, I'll be like, cool. So there's so many things you can use. But if you're like, so you, so I had, I had a guy come up to me and ask me, so they're like, you and your girlfriend scissor? 
And I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I looked and I was like, so how long did it take you to come up with that question? No, 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 no. Wait, wait. Before I, you answer, before I answer yours, you answer mine. Did you sit there and did you really think this is the most intelligent question X is making? I, I'm going to die. No, no, we don't. Please, please, please leave me alone. And we were, you know me, but apparently you don't know me enough to know how to properly ask me. I'm a very open book. I think, and Chelsea knows this. Mm -hmm. When we we were in rehearsals, anybody asked me a question, I was fairly open about it. I didn't care. I will give any information that you want to know. You just gotta, you can't be rude about it. There's just a way to ask things. Yeah. And I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad to hear everybody say that because like, that's what I tell people. I'm just like, so you wouldn't approach someone and be like, so why are you straight? Like, that's just like, and if if you wouldn't, if you wouldn't say that to someone who you would consider, like, uh, I I hate to use this word, but you would consider normal to you, then why would you ask a question that should come from curiosity and a place of understanding in such an insulting way? I think that we've watched enough satirical BuzzFeed videos about like things people ask gay people Mm -hmm. like i i don't i don't think people ask them i mean the big one would be who's the man and who's the woman but like i have not been asked that in like a mazillion years and i'll tell you why so i can't say that it speaks for everyone but what it did speak for me is when modern family came on and mitch and cameron started joking my father all of a sudden and he was very accepting. My mother was not. But my father was was very accepting or tried to be about my sexuality. When he watched Modern Family, he learned how gay people bicker and laugh and joke about their own gayness. And like he learned what jokes were funny and what jokes were mean. And he started making really funny jokes. Hmm. And it was just like, oh, you, you get us now. So it wasn't so much a, oh, what questions do I get? It's more of a, oh, I understand why those questions would or would not be acceptable, you know? Yeah. And then he would ask the ones that were normal. And I, 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 th- I, I really give that show a lot of credit. I think my least favorite question was, how did you know you were a lesbian? How did you know you were straight? And they're <laughs> like, what? I mean, there's other ways of asking that question instead of, how did you know you were gay? How did you know you're a lesbian? More like maybe, so when did you know? Or, you know, maybe it's a who. Because I know in, in my in my sister's life, she dated guys and she met the right girl that made her do the change, I guess. To me, to me, I get the most asked question that I think me and any other gay male gets is... <laughs> Who's the guy and who's the girl? The funny thing about being gay is that there are two guys. <laughs> if I wanted a girl, I would go out and I would get a girl. <laughs> so, like, somebody has to be I'm dominant. Just, no, not they not don't. Me. And if yeah. you're dominant, that doesn't like, make you the guy. Me. And if you're submissive, that doesn't make you the girl. Oh, my God. Well, that's another thing. Why, Why are we making these words synonymous? <laughs> it's not the same I thing. Know. Kyle, that's so funny you said that because when um, people find out that my uncles are gay... They always ask, so who's the girl? I'm like, they're both oh, men. <laughs> like, right. like all of the questions derive from, well, who's the man and who's the woman? Yeah. And if you look at Cam and Mitch, I don't know who's the man and who's the woman. And if you look at Dale and myself, um, I don't know who the man and who the woman is. But like who 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 perform who is performatively female at any given moment and who is performatively male? Um, which I suppose is asking what sexual positions to take, but it's more than that. It's like who takes out the garbage and who washes the dishes. I think that's what they're trying to figure out. And when you look at the two of them and you look at the two of us, it's like, oh, half of me is Cam and half of me is Mitch. And, and the other half of Cam is Dale and the other half of Cam is Mitch. And like, they're, they're like, they're like very much like exactly us, but not us at all. And it really helped my dad understand, oh, it's just people being people. So I don't get a lot of the weird, weird questions anymore. Yeah. I might have 10 years ago and I might have let it go. I'm not sure. Although when I was in New Brain with you and I kissed a boy who was pale with dark hair, a lot of people in the audience did scream, are they brothers? Yes, to I which remember I wanted that. to say, yes. have you ever kissed your brother <laughs> this way? This is not how you kiss your brother. Yeah, they were so confused. I don't understand that. Like they may... 
That was stated before the kiss. It was stated. William Finn makes lyrics go by very fast, so maybe they missed it. And yeah, they were I older. mean, they however, were old, the kiss should have made it clear: no brothers ever kiss themselves that way. No. What progress do you think has been made as a whole, and what do we still need to work on and see so far? Uh, the biggest thing is that you know we have come far. The Marriage Act um, adoption being legal for same-sex couples, which once upon a time wasn't a thing, and in some Absolutely. states still is not a thing. Even though technically um, it's supposed to be countrywide, but yeah. Yeah, but in Texas, they still are holding on to not allowing that. But we have come far as, you know, putting it on television and not putting it on television just sexually, but actually putting it on television to properly to properly broadcast it exposing children to it in a way in which they understand and showing children that have same same sex parents that not everything is that they're not weird. Mm -hmm. Um, There's a children's show called Steven universe. And if anybody doesn't watch it, I would uh, heavily suggest that you watch it. There's so many LGBT characters. There there are gay characters. There are lesbian characters. There's actually a character named Granite who is made up of two lesbians, which is amazing. Mm. And it's it's a way to expose children to it without overly exposing. Uh, there's a there should still be. I don't know if there is, but there was talks of a gay couple on Sesame Street. Cool. Um, which which is a good way to again expose to children who have same sex parents that they are not weird. Mm-hmm. that they are not strange and what we need to work on we need to work on of course acceptance of all of the lgbt community mm-hmm. it is not just lesbians it's not just gays there right. are so many other people hate crimes need to stop altogether and there need to be ways to protect this community protect us in any way possible people should not be able to decide that they can't bake us a cake because we're gay um people yeah. shouldn't be able to uh refuse to give us a marriage license because we're gay. There shouldn't be people, trans people who are killed every day because of who they are. There shouldn't be people who are killed every day because they are part of this community, whether it be because they're gay and they just happen to look over and then look back and then they get killed. We have so many, we have so many things uh, educate ourselves on. I think the biggest thing is that people need to be educated. Definitely. You need to educate if you are ignorant, you are choosing to be ignorant because there are so many ways to fully know about us, to fully know about how, why, who we can talk to. If you have questions, if you're questioning yourself, whether you're a part of it, there are so many ways to educate yourself. There's books, there's the internet, there's television, there's people. There are so many things that you have no room to be ignorant. And so don't willingly be ignorant. TV has been so great about it. It's I think it started off as like Will and Grace or like even Ellen mm-hmm. DeGeneres had a show in the 90s and yeah. you know she came out as a lesbian altogether but they spun it into her character. Will and Grace came out and like who doesn't love Will and Grace? Oh, it's great. You have Grace <laughs> that has lesbian couples, mm-hmm. straight couples deal with deal with like so many issues. Once it's being so well represented and once upon a time, that wasn't a thing. So I'm very glad that that has now become a concern for people. And it's sad that it took dark, dark times of suicides and murders and all those other things for people to realize that we need to really sit, talk about this. But sometimes, and this is so sad, but sometimes to take darkness, it takes darkness to fully bring out light. And so I think yeah. that we're almost at the end of the tunnel we're not there yet but we're almost there and you just we just need a smaller push of really getting to educate ourselves on any aspect in which you do not understand it doesn't even have to be lgbtqaa it can be anything else it can be so many other things that you're ignorant about but you have no room to be ignorant in this day and time and in this society because there are so many outlets to learn. Awesome. Well, like I always say, at the end of this podcast, we all need to stay curious. I was partying hardy when gay marriage became a national right. So that's that I think is the biggest victory that that we've had in yeah. our 50 year history for gay liberation. Um, it's, it was huge. Right. And, was, your, and your marriage was before that, right? 
So was that a difficult situation for you to figure out the, like getting the rights to it? No, um, but it was a thing. As you know, I live in New Jersey now and You've been to my house. I yeah. love my house. Your Dale house is great. loves my house. My house is so great. Your right? house is great. I always want to hang out at your house. <laughs> You're always welcome. Okay. Yes. No. So we love living in our house and we love living in Montclair, which is, you know, not the gayest town in the world, but does have a, a fair number of gay people mm-hmm. and, and is very gay friendly and is very progressive. And, and that's wonderful. Um, it has its problems too, but anyway. we, Dale was adamant about, not being married and not or not holding a wedding and not moving to a state where marriage wasn't legal, which meant I had to keep paying Manhattan rent for a long for well at least for another year, you know. <laughs> so so we got married in New York City and we thought about it. We're like, well, we could. My family was from New Jersey. We could come to New Jersey, but we thought, you know, I've lived in New York for 15 years. You've lived here for 10. Like, I'm not a New Jersey guy. You're, you've never lived in New Jersey. That's not yeah. us. We even looked at venues in Brooklyn and we're like, Dale, I've been to Brooklyn like five times in the last 15 years, you know? So it's like, no, we got to get married in Manhattan. This is where we're from. And it's legal here and it supports us. And Andrew Cuomo did an amazing, amazing job of forming a coalition to to make it legal in New York State. Um, and had it not become legal in New York State, we would have probably had to have gone to Connecticut, where, you know, I went to college, so I have some connection, but it's not it's not the same thing, right? So... Getting married in New York was not a problem, but definitely when it became legal in New Jersey, it opened options for the two of us to say, okay, where do we want to, you know, put down roots and start a family and spread out and and, and, and buy a wonderful house, et cetera. And I think that, you know, when it became legal nationally, that 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 says that says a lot, you know. It, it, you know, because it meant that, like, if 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 we were just w- we were just one couple that were thinking, should we move twelve miles away or not? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then you think of like someone who's like, oh, I live in Illinois in Chicago, where it's legal, but I happen to get a great job offer in Cincinnati where it's not. You know, what do you do with that? Right. So it was it was important because if you were in a state where it wasn't legal, they didn't have to recognize it. Was that the situation at the time? Yeah. No, they, they did not. In fact, uh, the state of Texas became really interesting because there was an interesting court case in the state of Texas where a couple got married in Massachusetts way back when when Massachusetts was like the cool place to be to get gay mm-hmm. married. But then they moved to Texas. I don't remember why. And then they got divorced. And that's sad. You know, some marriages end in divorce not 50 percent. that statistic is wrong but anyway about a quarter of marriages end in divorce and and theirs did and because they because gay marriage was not legal in the state of texas by default gay divorce was not legal in the state of texas so they couldn't get divorced they had to like move back one of them had to move back to massachusetts for six months like it it, it was a, it was a clusterfuck of laws that's that's insane <laughs> and that's the kind of thing. It's like, hey, part of it is about civil rights and part of it is just about a well-functioning society, right? Mm-hmm. So as a cis male, white, affluent, gay person, I don't face a lot of the day-to-day discrimination that a lot of people in our community do. And I'm fortunate of that. And I, and I, and I try not to feel guilty about that. But I, mm-hmm. I, I don't know. I try and do what I can do to, to help. There are absolutely like people who are facing housing discrimination and people who who are facing cake discrimination, which frankly, yes, there's <laughs> cake discrimination, but that cake probably tasted like shit. I'm not saying you should have to get another cake, but like I don't want to eat that cake anymore. Like I just don't I'm not blaming I'm not victim shaming, but oh my god, that, no, the cake thing makes me mad. Um yeah. no, we gotta deal with that. An interesting thing, which is like just my own personal weirdness. And if you want to be a nerd, I read word for word Justice Kennedy's ruling on gay marriage. And um, yeah, and it was cool and it was loving and it really did. You know, you brought up religion earlier. It really did read like a sermon. It was really about the power of love and how the power of love is fundamental. And I'm, I'm obviously misquoting. I read this in 2013 and that's five years ago. And it kind of just sort of said, 
gays need to get married because they love each other. And how can you stand in the way of that? And, and that made me feel good because someone cared. But it also made me feel nervous because it's not a very solid legal argument. And that's where I think we're now getting into trouble with these cake things. Whereas, and this is, this is, this is like a very nerdy legal argument, right? But it's in the law that gender discrimination is illegal. Like, that is a thing, right? So if I want to marry a woman, I can. But if I want to marry a man, I can't. You are now discriminating, not me. You're not injuring me. You're injuring my prospective spouses because you won't treat them equally based on their gender. Ah, that's a good argument. I like it, it is a good argument. And <laughs> it was put forward in 2013. It was like one of the arguments. And like, that's an argument that was based on pure legal logic. Very unemotional, totally not the like have a parade in the street. I understand what we did in 2013, but it's like, had we gone cold and legal, I think we could have said like, fuck these cake people. Like, you know, like, this is the deal. And I think now we're kind of in a love is love is love place, which is a wonderful slogan. It, it really is. Mm -hmm. But the work that we need to do to answer your question, is to get beyond happy accepting slogans. Well, at some point, we got to look at the rules and say, like, this yeah. is what the rules are. Um, like use your brain. I, that's part of what we need to do. And we need to do it because not everybody is a cis male white gay man from Montclair. Um, I actually read an, uh, an article today, which, which was horrible. It, I, I had to do some research. So there was this gay man in South Dakota. And um, he was sentenced to death. That's, That's a good opening for a story. So okay. a gay man was sentenced to death. You know, <laughs> this is a good, he walked into a bar, right? Now, I had to do some research because the New York Times wouldn't tell me why. But he did, he did murder somebody. So he's a murderer. Okay. So I'm not out to defend him as a murderer. I certainly believe he should be punished. He, I think he had a dispute with his boss and he stabbed him in the neck. Oh, so, wow. okay. Well, that's, so, so, yeah. <laughs> so, so I'm not defending the man. Problem is that the Supreme Court, act the, the Supreme Court of the United States, just today or yesterday, I guess, denied to hear his appeal because he was sentenced to death as opposed to sentenced to life in prison. The jury in question, and juries are sort of with. There are exceptions, and and they, like in terms of absolute racial animus, which should apply to LGBT animus, but. Jury's decisions are jury's decisions. That's society's decision. That's like how it runs. But they decided, oh, if he's gay, prison would probably be fun for him because he'd have a roommate and think of all the gay sex he'd have. So we can't oh give him life in prison. No, I'm not kidding. We can't give him life in prison. Therefore, we need to execute him. Now, this does not excuse the fact that he stabbed his boss in the neck. But... Yeah. It is a crazy warped logic that happens in society. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, so while things are getting better, like we always have to be vigilant about like, how can we make them get better? Cause they're not going to get better without us. What can allies do those who are um, like myself and Chelsea, what can we do and what can we say to others to make the LGBTQ community feel safe about coming out and feel safe about speaking speaking out and really embracing who they are what would you say would be tips for allies so and i think it's the most important question because this is also my advice to any struggling individual who's experiencing any mixed feelings about people and just not knowing who they are not, not, not being sure and it's also advice for the allies super important to be supportive and you know if you are struggling out there you know just know you it sounds so cliche but you are not alone especially in this time and day there are so many other people going through it and no one can ever tell your story and no one can ever fully understand what's happening to you in your life because they are not seeing it through your eyes but allies out there your job is to just be good friends and be a good support system. Let them come to you. Let them talk to you. 
ask those appropriate questions at the appropriate times. And if, if, especially if you don't understand, but just because you don't understand, don't be closed minded because like we've said, we are humans. We are all humans and we love who we love. Sometimes we know why sometimes we don't heck. (laughs) I still don't know why I like men because they suck. Girls are awesome, <laughs> but <laughs> no, they're not. Um, the girls are some good. Ones. I've been blessed with such an amazing, amazing support system from day one. I've had so many friends and family members that I could talk to and just vent, and at the end of the day, could go to anyone, any one of them, and they would help me in the blink of an eye. So, allies out there, don't be afraid to help out someone if you see them struggling that can be such a a weird thing because you might not even know you, you might not know someone is struggling with anything, let alone a self-identification crisis. But, you know, you see someone sad, just acting not normally, how you see them just get involved. That's, that's my big thing. Awesome. It's basically, you can do one thing, but you can do it on two fronts. Okay. Um, You can, and the one thing is you can come out as a vocal ally. Gay people need to be accepted by their government and therefore, you know, the society at large who may or may not support them. And and gay people need to be accepted by their communities. And I think it's clear over the last 50 years that the way that gay people have gained acceptability. And when I say gay people, I mean LGBT people. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm just shorthanding it because it's my own personal bias. Uh, see, see, my trans friend would yeah. be shaking a finger at me. So I'm just like, okay. But um, the way that the way the community has gained acceptance is through visibility. It's it's why we put such a premium on coming out. But I can only come out to so many people. Like I'm I'm done coming out. Like when I meet you, you know I'm gay, but I don't actually come out to you, right? Right. right. Like when I met you, I, I didn't say yeah, hi, I don't Chelsea. Think you I'm told gay. Me you were gay, yeah. But you right? know, I you at some point mentioned your husband, and it's just you know you kind of it's sort of understood. Like people figure it right. out. Right. But no. But there was a time where I had to tell people, and there was a time where I had to tell my best friends like my three best friends and they were like, well, we know. And I'm like, right, but it's important that I tell you. And here's what, you know, the more that you on a societal level say, mom, this is my gay friend, Mike, or, or hi, waiter at a restaurant. This is my friend and his husband and we're celebrating their anniversary or, you know, hot, like to, to whomever, you know, and I'm, the more that you normalize it to other people, the more that you make us visible, because honestly, we are, by realistic estimates, 3% of the population. I know people want to say 10%, but it's just not demographically right, right? <laughs> so it's like, we need... It feels we- like that, though. I feel like I know a lot of you. Yeah, but that's because you're a theater girl who's a nerd who does a podcast. This is true. This is true. But it feels in my mind like 10% sounds more accurate to my experience. But when you but when you look at like the population of Wyoming and the population, you know, and and it's not that people in Wyoming are gay. It's just that the gay people leave Wyoming, Mm -hmm. you know. But like I worked at a company where 1% of the people were gay and they were like, we've got to do better. And it's like they wanted that 1% to have a voice. And they were a very nerdy company. So they measured this shit. So I know that 1% of the population <laughs> was gay. But it wasn't far off. Like when you talk about like Hispanics are 33% of the population. Most right. people are, are shocked to learn that African Americans are only 12% of the population. Like that seems right. shockingly low depending Actually, on yeah. what area of the country you live in. And in other, con- in other parts, sensitive parts of the country, you may never see a black person because they're not evenly distributed neither are gay people so we're only about three percent we're not going to win any votes on our own so politically you've got to tell your congressman or whomever that it's important to you and then socially you've got to tell mom dad and the mailman that it's important to you in actuality and i know you know this like gay people aren't scary and we're kind of we're kind of fun and fabulous, but only when people decide to meet us, you know? And I think that's what we've been trying to do for the last 50 years. And I think it's working, but as a straight ally, there's 97% of you, you could, you could help us. Not that you haven't been, but you know, that's what you do. Yeah. It'd be exactly what you claim to be, which is an ally. 
movements need people who are not affected by it. The civil rights movement was very important. It was very big. Black people needed what they needed and they got what they needed, but they also had their white counterparts who were helping to fight with them just as much. The Mm -hmm. LGBT fight is never going to be over. Equality is very hard to reach. And it's sad, but if you are a straight ally, you have to be just that, an ally. And don't... I think the biggest thing that I've found is, just like you said, talk to your friends and realize that things are... Things are important. Things are things are so dangerous out here. A, a young woman was at a club, got hit on by a guy, told the guy that she was a lesbian and was not interested. The guy found out where she lived and killed her and her girlfriend in, in their bed while they were sleeping. Oh there, there are these moments terrible. of hate crimes that happen with trans women who have already stated that they were trans and men fell some type of way because they were dancing with them, but they wanted to talk to them and then they killed them. They, uh, there are, of course, gay bashing incidents and and things that happen because people don't know how to properly adjust to the world being the world. And a straight person will live, listen to a straight person quicker than they will listen to the LGBTQ community. It is so sad that it's that, but it right. is that. So sort of using like straight privilege, quote unquote, to help? Yeah, to just simply be like, this is where I march. This is where I stand with the things that don't affect you. Gay marriage doesn't affect your straight marriage. It never will. Yeah. It never can. It, it legally cannot. Having gay people on television will not turn your child gay. Just like if they watch BET, it will not turn them black. These are these are things that are <laughs> that are normal and that shouldn't have to be said, but they have to be said, and we're not being listened to. So the the LGBTQ and there's an A at the end now. So there's an LGBTQAA, which stands for lesbian, bisexual, gay, trans, queer, asexual, and allies, because they are just as important as the rest of us. That's really cool. I didn't know that. You are just as important to our movement and to our community and to our families as the rest of us are. Um, Also, do not fetishize any part of that, of the community. It is a big thing men who are like, yeah, you know, I'm all for it. I'm all for the LGBTQ community. But then it's like, oh, you have a girlfriend? Could you kiss her real quick? Don't do that. Yeah, no. If you're, oh God. if you are for, if you are for the community, you are for all of the community. If you, if you're like, I'm all for the LGBT community, but if a, I don't like trans people. They're a part exactly. of the community. You can't pick and choose. Also, if you know I like girls, that does not mean that I want to date you. I have standards. Doesn't mean that you don't reach them. It just means that just because you found out that I like girls does not mean that you have to be like, well, I mean, just so you know, I'm straight. I know girl and I don't want you, even if you weren't. That's just, (laughs) I know, I know, I know you're straight. And I I make a lot of jokes with my straight friends and I'm like, yeah, girl, one day. But it's, it's a joke. And my friends know that it's a joke. You literally see me with my girlfriend. It's also about talking to people and me being a part of the community, being willing to help. You can't ask questions if I'm not willing to answer them. And so I can't be like, nobody wants to listen to me. No one wants to understand me if I'm not willing to be understood. Mm -hmm. Once dialogue stops on both sides, there's no side that's right. Right. And listeners, definitely, if you don't know too many people in this community and you want to reach out and ask questions, that's something that is really important. And maybe taking that first step, just talking to somebody. That might make a huge if difference. If you're uncomfortable, there are so many books. There's books about Stonewall. There's there's books about Matthew Shepard, who was a yeah. very bad, bad uh, gay bashing incident. But there's biographies about people who were in that light. Like it's, if you, at the, this day and age, you have no excuse to be ignorant. There's the yes. internet. There are books. If you are not willing to reach out to people, there are so many ways to get your information. And then once you get that information, if you now feel comfortable, you can talk. But if even if you're like, well, I don't want to talk to them, but I want to know. So go to the library, pick up a book, go on the internet and research things. There are so many blogs and willing. There are so many people that are the internet that are telling their stories that are ready to help you learn. So if, at this point, you have to go out of your way to be ignorant. Also, have Absolutely. you seen have you seen the movie called Love Is All You Need with like a question mark? No. Amazing movie that is based loosely on the Matthew Shepard story, but it flips Mm -hmm. the world. So the norm is to be homosexual and the people who are heterosexual are the ones who 
are having the same oppression of that community. And when it flips it that way, even for me, for someone who has always considered myself to be an ally, I've always had friends within the community. Looking at it that way, it's like, oh, it, it, it does shift your perspective, even for someone who is already open to every different type of person. So I think that's a really important movie. It's There's graphic scenes. There's a lot of violence, which is which is true to the story, which is true to what happened. It's but, true to life. Yeah, but you are, you're watching a couple fall in love, couple, a heterosexual couple. At that point, looking at it in the reverse perspective, just because it is like you, if you are a heterosexual individual watching this movie, it's, it's very eye-opening. And it does impact people when you see it the other way because people are like, what, wait, what? No, this doesn't make sense. And then it's like, no, same. It doesn't make sense the other way as well. If you ever have a chance to, or if somebody ever puts up, I think it's called the Learming Project, which is which is the Matthew yeah. Shepard story after, which is a full play. Yeah, it doesn't have the graphics, but it leaves an audience thinking because mm -hmm. it is the story of the investigation of what happened, of why he was killed in the first place. Thanks for having me. Um, I know that you all like books on the Sapio Files, so since we're talking about LGBT issues, I just wanted to um, give a shout out to um, my favorite book in the entire world, which is a super nerdy book. It's about a hundred thousand words, which means it's good like five hundred pages long. But it's called At Swim Two Boys. That's At Swim Comma Two Boys by Jamie O'Neill. And it takes place in the Easter Revolution in Ireland, which is when Ireland like rebelled against England. And it's it's just this beautiful gay love story between this boy and this older boy, and they try and swim to an island, but like one's too strong, one's not strong enough that he can't make it. And it sounds so horribly cliche, but it is literally the most beautiful and heartfelt love story that I think I've ever read between these two guys and then a much older gentleman with a dark seated past. And um, if you're into heavy historical drama, go for it because it's about 80% in English and 10% in Gaelic and 10% in Latin. And you just have to figure out the parts that you don't speak and read it in July when Pride is over. All right. All right. So awesome. Thank you so much for talking to us today and sharing so many interesting perspectives. Thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you guys so much for having me. I'm glad to be here. Have a good night. As someone who's considered myself an ally ever since my uncle came out to me when I was nine, I know that I still have so much more learning and growing to do. And that's humbling, but I'm also really excited to learn more and yeah. become a better ally for the community. So thank you. And then um, I guess as a blanket thing before I sign off, I just want to thank all the individuals who are within the LGBTQAA community and just know that you always have an ally in me and that you can always reach out to me, whether it's through this podcast or if you're a listener who's my friend already and you need someone to talk to, please reach out and continue to just be you. Thank you so much for joining us for our very special LGBTQAA Pride Month edition of the Sapio Files. If you would like to join this very important conversation, please feel free to reach out to us. We have an email, sapiofilespodcast at gmail.com. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at the Sapio Files. And you can always leave us a comment and rate and review us wherever you listen to this podcast. An extra special thanks to our guests this week for all the time you put in with us and helping us learn more about your wonderful community. Keep an open mind, continue to learn, and always stay curious. See you next week.